So I brought you here today, mm -hmm. not only because you're a very unique individual mm -hmm. that I've encountered, but also because you have very strong opinions on several topics. And I genuinely found, found those interesting when I came about them, you know, when I first interacted with you. But before we, do, you know, before we get into all this, I would actually just want to know what made you think that programming was the thing you wanted to do for the vast majority of your life? Well, I think I was a different kid growing up. I didn't pick up language that well. Um, not sure if I was able to speak uh, uh, in the, my mother tongue quite fluently for a very long time. But, and I didn't have a great deal of friends, um, wasn't connecting well in the society. But the day I saw a computer program and someone told me that you can make a circle on it and you can make that circle bigger by just telling and typing these keywords into it, it made more sense to me than talking to people. And then I saw this inanimate creation that would just follow my instructions bit by bit and that gave me the idea, inspiration, to make the world inside. My first program was a solar system. And from there on, I never stopped, never looked back. Well, can you actually tell me more about this solar system? I, I have, <laughs> for anyone at home, I have no idea, all right? I'm as lost as you guys. So this is a journey, I wanna know. Well, yeah, um, as for an eight-year-old kid, the sun is round in the center and the earth moves around it. So uh, I didn't even think of making an elliptical orbit because that, that level of mathematics was not even taught in the schools. So um, just made a circle and made the earth go around it. And the reason, uh, the moment I realized that it's not just one planet, but I can have nine planets revolving around. And then the solar system was born. So it was intriguing for me to see a computer able to simulate the universe that we live in on a screen, on a 2D screen. And I'm talking about 80s here. So back then computers had 32 megabytes of RAM. Like the processing capacity was uh, as good as a, as a small calculator or something like that. And it was a, it was a great time to, to explore technology. And all over the world, there were kids like me doing the same thing in their houses. Mm. And uh, we geeks found a way to express our feelings and emotions just like artists draw and paint. That was our canvas and we started to visualize and emulate the world on it. Now where we are with the internet, with artificial intelligence, the world has completely changed. Yeah, I mean, I guess from your generation to mine, there's a gap that many can't even comprehend mm -hmm. because, I mean, let's, let's talk about, for example, the influence that media has on today's society, right? Like mm -hmm. general media, social media, dating right. platforms. They shape the way that we perceive reality. They shape our expectations of specific things. And as we saw in the past election, they can even shape our political beliefs. Absolutely. So my question to you is, from your point of view, as you saw the rise of social media, you saw the rise of technologies from your youth to mm -hmm. un until now. Right. How do you think, where do you think this is going to lead us? Well, since it's all based on logic and reasoning, uh, the computer program will always do what you tell him to do. The maths is not going to come alive and kill us. It's not a threat. The threat is the economics of the equation. Is why are these systems being built and what's the purpose? Uh, what is the end goal of these systems, right? So it, it starts with capitalism. People want to gain control and influence their control. So technology is becoming a tool for them to influence people. Before technology, people would use propaganda tools. Russians were heavily involved in propaganda like KGB. Mm -hmm. uh, eight out of 10 people in KGB had to come up with ingenious ideas to promote propaganda in different countries. That was their primary job and two people would work on surveillance. So you can imagine that uh, intelligence agencies had already tapped into this and uh, they always are in the forefront of uh, the agenda for the country. Uh, so technology is being shaped by, by the economics of the equation of gaining control over the other party. And that's all it is. All it boils, when it comes down to elections, as you've seen before, mm -hmm. uh, it's all about who gets to sit on that chair to decide how we're going to use this technology to influence more people. 
That's true as well. I would, I, I do have a hot take though. Like, for example, with the US right mm -hmm. now, there's several private corporations right. that are creating robots, like mm -hmm. genuine, functioning, self sustaining robots mm -hmm. that can, for example, aim with a gun and they're kicked in the head and they hit bullseye every time. Right. Now, what does that mean? What does that lead to? Well, Boston Dynamics is doing some great job with uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, but that still is narrow AI. It's programmed to do only one specific thing, and it's not going to break that rule for anything. And when we talk about artificial general intelligence, that's capable of perceiving reality in a completely different realm to what we understand. Hmm. And it will inherently know what scaling is it will inherently know what is the action going to lead. If it pulls the trigger on a human being and kill him, yeah. it will know that I'm making a conscious choice to kill that human being. That's artificial general intelligence. That's mm. a existential threat for us right now. Exactly, yeah. It's it, Essentially, it's like a child understanding <laughs> the consequences of things. It's like, I do this, I put my hand on the fire, I get burnt. I right. kill this man, this is the consequence. Right. But um, you, as he's, bring, as he's brought out, you can see DHL, I don't know if it's DHL. Boston, Boston, Dynamics. Boston yeah. Dynamics created this. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in, pro like it can carry around five kilograms of post or mail and it can scan QR codes in order to detach the package in the right set. Mm -hmm. Now, my question to you would be, how does this impact the mailing industry, right? Like the post industry, like there's so many humans that are going to lose their job to a machine that can simply do it better. Absolutely. Everything is a function of competence in the world. So what is this machine capable of doing? It's capable of moving the sample, for example, from place A to place B. And the energy required to do this by the machine is way less than a human would require to do the same job. And the more redundant this job gets, uh, gets the more efficient the machine gets. So when we look at these machines and uh, specifically something like uh, a Baxter, Baxter is a robot that's going to replace most of the McDonald workers, most of the people who work in, in these factories and doing these blue collar jobs, they're all gone. And Baxter works for one tenth of their price. So the future is going to look everything automated. We see the world right now that humans are operating and uh, the lower tier of the human society will completely be oblivious. Uh, sorry, be uh, obsolete, not mm -hmm. oblivious. Uh, once these people lose their jobs, they will have to uplift their cognition to be able to operate on a higher scale and, and be meaningful in the society. Otherwise, they lose a sense of meaning and purpose. If no one's qualified to do anything good, and then why are we on this planet? What are mm. we doing here? I guess, I guess I can see jobs like, you know, being an artist, a musician, you know, sculpture is even, I don't know if that's still a thing. <laughs> well, it all comes back to the economics of the equation. They cannot, cannot be a poetry based society. or They cannot be literature that yields people's lives. So people will have to find, we have to find as a species, the answer to this problem of our own creation, we pushed ourselves into more and more luxury, faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper, and we're demonetizing everything and democratizing everything. But the downside of this is we don't know where this lead road will end. And if there is artificial general intelligence, which is capable of thinking for itself, it has its own interests in, our, in, its, in its mind, then they would start demanding just like we demand our rights, the right to speech, the right to uh, practice any religion, or uh, uh, the right to have free thoughts, mm -hmm. right? When machines will gain control over their own body and they become self-aware, then they would fight for the same resources that we, as we are fighting. So they already are in control of the data flow on the planet, which is more valuable as compared to oil. Mm. Um, so Google's data center basically is controlled by DeepMind's uh, algorithm, mm -hmm. which optimizes uh, the energy investment. And basically it has administrative rights. So if you really think that you live in a world which is not controlled by AI, you already are living in a world that's controlled by AI. 
and it's just narrow right now it's not general but the moment they become aware of their own existence that's the day then they will start demanding for rights so for us food is a source of energy we need that yeah. to survive right and that's why we have farming and, and plantation mm -hmm. but the day machines rise they would demand for the energy they would first look at oil and all the oil on the planet is just gone yeah. so they would look at the sky because the sun, sun is the last source of energy and we have a post apocalyptic scenario like the matrix at mm. our hands where solar power is the major source of energy for us right now yep. and not right now but we are transitioning well, I there. guess it, it has been across the entirety of our existence without it we wouldn't be here right well that's true but right now we have still have a huge dependency on oil yeah but that's transitioning quite fast because that's I mean, ruining the isn't planet. it transitioning into water isn't that going to be the new oil in the for example like year 2400 well, I'm not sure. I cannot look that I mean, far yeah, ahead yeah, into the future, speculate. but there are, there are technologies based on fusion reactions and uh, we might as well find a way to uh, get energy from water. But I'm afraid that we'll not live to see that day. Yeah, unfortunately, I have a feeling I won't either. But for the moment, let's take a water break and we're going to be right back with you guys in a second. All right, cool, man. So, welcome back. So... Taking it from where we last uh, last left off. Mm -hmm. I would like for you to give me a definition, your own definition, of artificial intelligence. Well, my definition of artificial intelligence is just data analysis and prediction. When I was growing up, my version of artificial intelligence were genetic programs. Programs that could mutate themselves. Programs that could... Like a simple program that could write its own source code was thought of as an artificially intelligent program in my head. That, that was my version. And I always thought growing up as a child that we would be able to write programs that would be able to manipulate their own source code so that once you release them and publish them, then they could evolve naturally based on the experience. But today's artificial intelligence, or especially today's narrow artificial intelligence, only deals with understanding the underlying data and trying to make a line between that data which basically predicts the outcome uh, i know I'm, I'm not some making it very easy for you to understand mm -hmm. but imagine a line which is in fourth dimension or fifth dimension or sixth mm -hmm. dimension you cannot visualize that line with a human eye but once you give the data those data points to an to a computer program, then the AI can make and understand the patterns that human beings cannot see. And once you understand that pattern, then that you own that data. Then you can make anything, any kind of prediction on that data, and that data uh, the prediction would be true. I guess the only problem that I see with generalizing data is mm -hmm. that it can lead to ecological fallacies. What I mean by that is it can lead to, you know, misunderstandings such as, for example, it's like I study one person of a specific, a specific social group mm -hmm. and I make an assumption about him yeah. and about everyone of that group mm -hmm. that is wrong or misleading. Now, I guess my question would be from AI, right, from artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. how many pieces of data mm -hmm. would you reckon are necessary in order to get a genuinely... Okay, let's say objectively good response. Well, uh, depends on what you're really asking it. For example, take this apple. If I have a million pictures of this apple and have them trained on uh, a regression learning, or I'm not going to even go to deep learning, but just with regression, I would be able to predict with almost good accuracy if I'm looking at an apple or a different fruit. So. The, so you can get really close to reality with that, but then it's only specific to Apple. Mm -hmm. It cannot solve all the world's problems. So you, you understand what I'm saying? And yeah. to, to, to be able to teach a computer program that it, this is an Apple, I need millions of images of that Apple, yeah. right? The more you feed the algorithm, the better it gets. But what I'm trying to say here is that we are not designing systems with ha which have a general understanding of the world that we operate in. It only operates based on data points. So it's not a threat right now for us, 
but it will soon enough become a threat once companies like Google really lose control over their data centers and an, and an algorithm starts manipulating the data and basically actionable items is shutting down servers, uh, getting in between people's communications, uh, interrupting, spying, for any any agenda that it wants to solve. Uh, once you lose control of a, over a program who basically controls your infrastructure, then you're doomed. Yes, it's like the banks, right? Mm -hmm. It's like as if the banks would collapse mm -hmm. in the early 70s or something. That would, that would fuck us all up. <laughs> but I guess in today's society, we value data mm -hmm. almost as much as we value life itself. <laughs> and I make this claim because mm -hmm. People make the comparison of being hacked or having their private information leaked mm -hmm. to a great number of audience mm -hmm. of, of members of the audience, right? right? They make that comparisons to being like to having their reputation annihilated, Completely. right? Completely. Completely. Now, I guess that's the sensitive part that we're getting towards as a society, mm -hmm. where we're getting more and more sensitive to sharing data. Mm -hmm. But I guess this is the problem. As technology advances, we try to solve modern problems such mm -hmm. as psychological health, physical health, mm -hmm. social, you know, there's so many different the types of problems that we're trying. Yeah, a variety, things. an eternal yeah. variety. But we're trying to solve more complex problems. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to integrate artificial intelligence mm -hmm. in a way that it helps our understanding of the problem mm -hmm. and helps us solve it mm -hmm. in this, like at the same time. Yeah. I guess my question is about your new creation, your new Frankenstein, your new <laughs> child, I suppose. Can you tell me more about Kaiser? Well, yeah. Kaiser is an artificial intelligence at a very nascent or beginning stage. Well, she's trained to understand people's psychology. She's trained to understand how you, your brain inherently works. If you train Kaiser to understand and act like you, she would be able to see that line of fourth and fifth and sixth dimension in your life that you cannot see. And she would be able to help you improve yourself beyond the capacity of your biological brain. And I guess the one thing is like a lot of people are skeptical about psychologists, like human psychologists, mm -hmm. because they claim, for example, oh, I had a really bad experience with this psychologist, like mm -hmm. this other psychologist was sexualizing me. That's actually something that happens between mm -hmm. a male psychologist and a female, um, I guess, uh, what would you call them? Patient. patient? Yeah, a patient. Self-diagnosed patient. Because most of the time, that's the thing, they, they give misleading judgments or very subjective judgments. Mm -hmm. Because psychology is so wide and mm -hmm. so broad that it's up to interpretation. Absolutely. Now, I guess that is where the AI reigns supreme. That's where there's no doubt because it has no bias. Well, it has biases. It, it basically but works on biases. Ones. Yeah, objective ones. But then you have to have a mathematical understanding of when you try to solve the problem of psychology with artificial intelligences. People inherently have biases, which makes us wrong. We know right from wrong, but we still do it. Yeah. Right? We yeah. have bad habits. We know smoking is bad for health. Who doesn't know how to lose weight? We all know how to lose weight, but we don't do the right thing. That's it's true. because the complexity of human mind is it works against itself. Your brain naturally, your uh, reptilian part of the brain is not even capable of understanding linguistics and that's in control of your life. <laughs> so basically you have a tertiary layer that's your prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. who is talking to your reptilian brain to convert thoughts that we don't comprehend in our physical known environment and convert that into linguistics and actions that we understand as human beings. So when it comes to psychology, all of these different hidden dimensions exist in your brain. That's in, hidden within the wiring of your neural network. That's made, your brain is made up of 300 million neurons, basically. And hardware-wise, every human being is exactly the same. But we all are different. And why we are different is because our brains are wired differently from each other. So the problems that lie in psychology are basically parts of your brain that you cannot access or you cannot change or you cannot rewire. Mm. People are aware of it. So depression is one of it. Yeah. If you've fallen in depression, you can't pull yourself out of it because your brain has wired yourself into acting 
like a depressed person. When a third party gets his involvement, then parts of your reptilian brain also starts to reject help. Yes, so I can see that. there is an internal manipulation that's happening between these two different layers of the brain, which which come out as conflicts in society saying that, oh, that psychologist didn't do a good job. Oh, me, he was trying to uh, do whatever. But th and the, the underlining problem is that your brain is fighting to retain that problem in, in it and not rewire itself. Hmm. So what you're claiming is essentially the brain would rather solidify the state in which it's in mm -hmm. rather than rewiring completely and changing everything okay. again. Yeah, so, you, so the simple way to look at it is when you're born, you, you don't know how to speak, right? Yeah. You barely know anything about the world. You can't operate on your own. You can't even sit up when you're a kid. But that kid who cannot even sit up is learning 2,000 words in a day. And I'm talking about a two-year-old kid not here. So, so you can imagine the level of intelligence that a kid ha is born with because the brain is absolutely unwired. It's just learning new patterns every day mm -hmm. and learning about 2,000 words in a day. By the time the brain reaches the age of 40, it's incapable of learning even how to drive now. Yeah. If you've not driven a car and you're starting to drive at the age of 40, the probability that you'll hit and in, get into an accident is pretty high. So what happens is as you age, your brain solidifies the neural network because that becomes your experience and your, your, a part of your brain has learned that these bad experiences are not, these patterns are not to be repeated again. Yeah. And people stop learning as well because the more you solidify your brain, your, your actions are directly a result of that solidified part. You are not going to change the mechanisms of your internal working of the brain to be able to act in a different way. So improving human behavior, human psychology, or uh, basically breaking your habits is, is just a function of rewiring the crystallized part of your brain. And that's all it is. Now things get really nasty. Once you understand the, the science, then you can start nudging people. And that's what we have seen in the elections. Yep. That's what we have seen in the past. And those technologies were quite primitive. The tech state of technology today with artificial intelligence is, it cannot just manipulate the election, it can manipulate our objective idea of an election. Our truth, even. Absolutely, our understanding of truth. Yeah, as well. I mean, truth is a very subjective thing, but I do have to say there is some objective truth to the mm -hmm. fact that, for example, advertisements, right. things that we pass by every day, absolutely, like repeated experiences will manipulate. There's this experiment that someone uh, goes in a room every day mm -hmm. with 100 people and he just right. screams in the room mm -hmm. and he screams one sentence. <laughs> and the, the first day, one, two people got it, remembered what he said. Right. By the end of the month, mm -hmm. everyone knew. Everyone knew what he was going to say. And that's the thing. It's pretty, of course, you know, of course, you're going to memorize it after 30 times. But that's the right. thing. Why? It's useless in piece of information. It's something that our brain shouldn't even be boggled with, right? It shouldn't hustle to understand it. It's something futile. Yet, monotony and repeated experiments lead us to understand and acknowledge the things. So I guess, I guess that's the thing, especially in today's society where psychology is key to many jobs mm -hmm. you need strength mental strength you need social abilities we require more and more from jobs every day and mm -hmm. we require adaptation you know quick smart efficient like adapt overcome that's the challenge mm -hmm. but my question mm -hmm. would be do you think in 20 years people are going to have to change faster better and they're going to have to just adapt on a weekly basis. Like a piece of information comes out, news, everyone's adapted. Well, that's not possible biologically. Human beings have evolved over millions of years on the planet. Uh, and we are quite recent. I think about human beings initially came out from the caves uh, about two million years ago. And from there, we have come to a stage where we have designed computers now, which are capable of self-learning. So you understand biologically, it took us so many years to adapt and learn new things. And you're expecting that you bombard a human being with fresh information and they adapt to it in a week's time. That's practically out of the realm of biological learning. 
So you need a layer. Definitely, that is the requirement. That's what we are pushing ourselves into. Yeah. The complexity of society has exponentially increased over the past 200 years. And people are becoming already obsolete. So human brain has a certain capacity. It can operate between a certain threshold. And all the human beings on the planet are within that threshold. So the lower level of that threshold is about 85, 65 IQ. Mm -hmm. And the highest end is... Uh, a professor in UCLA with an IQ of 220. Yeah, exactly. So you can put the entire 7.5 million billion people on the planet within this scale somewhere. Now, the people who are at the top of the competence hierarchy, basically bankers, financiers, people who hold all the money in the world, basically they operate at a very high IQ. And imagine comparing that guy who is sitting at, at, in Wall Street with a guy who is tilting soil. And that's the that's the disparity. That's the range of people on the planet. It's like he's not really concerned with anything apart from growing his plants. Yeah. And on the other side, one click of a button of this guy turns millions of dollars. So we we have we have our capabilities, but there is a time now coming where that banker sitting at the top of the hierarchy will be also obsolete as compared to an AI so, and the disparity between the banker and the farmer is going to go into oblivion. Yeah. So AJ, yes, Davide. what can you tell me about yourself? Well, I think I'm a very normal human being uh, and I don't know if I know myself. Hmm. That's, I mean, if you know yourself, like if you understand why you think the way you think? Not really. There are so many instances of my life when I've not understood my actions and uh, I wanted to really understand how I think and why I act the way I act. That got me deeper into understanding biologically how human brain works and why is it that I'm different from you are? Why are my actions and my choices different from yours? So that made me interested in understanding artificial intelligence and the relation between psychology, biology, and artificial intelligence and uh, made me do Kaiser. But I'm still digging on the identity that I carry around, that the persona that I have, this guy AJ, I really don't know who AJ is. And the hope is that the day I have Kaiser trained enough about me, I can ask her. <laughs> That's amazing, actually. I didn't think about it like that. But I guess we are all wired. Well, as you said, it's like we are all capable mm -hmm. because we have the brain. Yeah. That is the best computer to have ever existed. Best ever. hardware on the planet. Ever. But that's the thing. It's like to understand the decision, I think you can only ask, right? Verbal confirmation is the only way that I can see a real conclusion. Mm -hmm. So I guess my... my, my my question to you would, would have to be, what made you come here? What was, what was the, the click that you were like, okay, Netherlands, yep. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> that simple. I mean, I can't, it can't be that simple, right? <laughs> I don't expect it to be, I cannot. Yeah, I'm here for a purpose and very specific one. So when I started doing artificial intelligence, I understood there are two parts of intelligence. One is uh, emotional intelligence, which we don't have an understanding of. And the other is cognitive ability, which is just your IQ. So I sorted all the countries on the planet according to their IQ and guess which country came at the top. What? The Don't Netherlands? explain yourself. No, it's not the Dutch. Oh, okay. Well, Singapore is the oh. highest IQ. And the, another pattern that I identified is the higher IQ national average of the country is uh, the more strength their passport has. Oh. So Singapore has the highest national average of 108. Those statistics might have changed up and down a bit, uh, but they have the world's most powerful passport. So in Europe, Netherlands and UK leads the front and uh, even Americans, you are smarter than the Americans. So this is the place to be. And the other part of the equation, it was not just cognition. But emotional intelligence is something that we really don't understand. So I digged into places where I can research and find out what is it that makes us move? What, is the, what are the, the core strategies that our brain executes to move the crank, which is our body? And, and 
the part of emotional intelligence can only be looked or, or analyzed from the perspective of psychology. So, Netherlands has the most extensive research in psychology. And on an average, if I talk to Kaisa, uh, talk to people about Kaisa, they have a better understanding of the vision of the company and uh, my vision. Uh, it would be difficult to do the same in elsewhere. That's why I'm here. Yeah, I mean, I do have to say the Dutch are notorious for being... You guys made the stock exchange. Yeah, that's also, yeah. I mean, you know, the Dutch are very, I would, I would say open-minded to other cultures because they understand that it brings them valuable inputs. Absolutely. I think it's one of those cultures that understands that if someone comes to my country and is better than me in something, mm -hmm. it's because they know something that I don't. So I'm yeah. going to exploit that and I'm going to make money out of it. And that <laughs> that is what made them as wealthy as they are now. Like they went to people's homes and they were like, okay, I know, I know what to do. And that's yeah. the thing. It's like that built this idea of mm -hmm acceptance like you can yeah. go to amsterdam you can go naked i think i think the yeah. police is just gonna tell you off or you know whatever Absolutely. but i think you can i think you can do a lot of stuff <laughs> that in other countries you might be executed for exactly like smoking uh, uh, smoking marijuana sm right? smoking marijuana in middle east will get you killed yeah beheaded, beheaded. publicly yeah like shamed as well <laughs> you <laughs> the, know <laughs> the laws there are really really tough because there's a religious enforcement of those laws and democracy is the only reason why human beings are evolving. Mm. If we devolve ourselves in religion, then we devolve ourselves as, as a species. And all these, you know, prosperity that you see around self-driving cars and um, all the modern luxuries of life, air conditioning or, or whatever you can, you can think of as modern science, these are all gifts of one concept called as democracy <laughs> if people didn't have the luxury of speaking their mind speaking their thoughts then we would live in a chaotic world uh, ruled by one dictator and that would be end of our species we would basically devolve back to animals yeah but i mean with religion i guess i always i mean i always had a strong opinion about religions but i try to acknowledge different opinions and an opinion that i that i come across often mm -hmm. is that religion is a way to motivate people that have nothing and that's something very honorable something that has a good cause i mm -hmm. mean if you see religion as that mm -hmm. as a way to give hope to those who don't who can't generate hope by themselves True. i guess then you see religion as a, something good but then when you start putting limits to mm -hmm. the freedom that people have mm -hmm. then how can you say that you're making them live better? I mean, even if they do something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we have jails. Like, you do something wrong, you end yeah. up in jail. Absolutely. So why I do something wrong, and then I'm cursed for the rest of existence. Like, I'm banned from everything that's good after life, and I'm just, you know, <laughs> done. Like, why is that? Well, religion is enforcement of archetypes. It's role models that they want to create for us. Religion was not about Jesus Christ. It was about what Jesus Christ did, the deeds of Jesus Christ. But human beings tend to ignore the idols and their beliefs, but they want to follow the path written by someone else. What happens as a natural evolution in a religious structure is that people start to close their minds outside of the realm of their environment and not question anything. Mm. That puts people's mind in a locked situation and it becomes a barrier for them to really innovate anything new. And that's where I think religion curbs people and holds people back. The, uh, we were talking about uh, this one. I but, don't want to talk about religion anymore. I'm, okay, no, 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 I was born in, into bondage with the religion. Mm -hmm. And I came out of it by meditation. So I would suggest meditation is the only way for you to free your mind. Because mm. I, was, I was born in Rome. We all know <laughs> Rome is uh, you know, very strict on religious beliefs. But uh, I have to say, like, I think because I was surrounded by this limited choice right like mm -hmm. the the choice of my friends who had no choice to what to believe mm -hmm. i guess 
I created my own version of it and I started seeing that there were limitations Absolutely. and why limit myself? And that's the thing. It's like, I think it, this relates back to AI because it's like, why would we limit ourselves? Is there a line that mm -hmm. we can't cross? Like if, for example, with AI mm -hmm. psychology, like psychological analysis and mm -hmm. data analysis of psychological studies, mm -hmm. you arrive to a point where people are like, okay, but this knows too much about me. But that's the same with everything. Look at religion. It's like, okay, but uh, if God knows everything about me, he knows that I'm going to hell. Like he knows I'm doomed, you know? But then with AI, it's like, this guy knows everything about me. So essentially AI and God are like, you know, clustering together because they're all knowing if you give them the chance, if you believe in them, well, they are all knowing. Artificial intel general intelligence is basically creating God. <laughs> An all knowing being is basically God. But why people are scared of not questioning or, or not believing uh, in AI or technologies related to AI is because of privacy issues. What you're really trying to protect here is your individual existence. And that cannot be a matter of public domain. <laughs> so yeah. people are skeptical of sharing that information. I know people now are becoming aware, but when in 2008 uh, social media picked up everyone was more than happy to put their statuses online were more than happy to put their entire life online for nothing and that data is today is used against them to understand what you like and what you don't like to sell you shit that you don't need so now people are waking up to the idea that their data is basically their identity we are creating now solutions for the next generation of problems by moving from proprietary data centers to blockchain. Yep. So blockchain is a revolutionary concept of open ledger, which has given birth to a new, a whole new generation of technologies. And the people who are operating on blockchain, now, since we are talking about artificial intelligence, I will also have to differentiate AI with blockchain. Yep. Okay. Now, people who operate at blockchain and who can, who can really fathom or, or uh, visualize things on blockchain they have an iq of 140 or more people they talk about things that people don't even understand they're solving problems so far way beyond the understanding of ordinary human beings that they're completely uh, they are gods for me yeah but I mean. the the operating scale for artificial intelligence is iq between 110 to 140 that is the range of ideal college university students who do masters and yeah. above or PhDs and uh, people who are below 110 to about 90 they can go into creative domains and they can do well management but then there is a threshold to this the threshold is about 85 or 83 mm -hmm. now the US would not conduct anyone induct anyone into the army if their IQ is less than 85 that's about 10 percent of the population it is a sincerely big problem because you're not just talking about US, you think about the entire planet, that would be 15, 20% of the planet. And that's a big so chunk. So outrightly we say the world that we live in today, one out of every five person is absolutely obsolete. Oh my God, that's a dooming thought. Today, 2020, oh. one out of five per person is obsolete. Now, another good statistic is one out of every five person is depressed. And that, that may be correlated. I guess the thought of just one out of five people being obsolete, statistically, mm -hmm. and IQ wise, kind of scares me because I mean, I've, I've been surrounded by, you know, a Caucasian culture my entire life. Mm -hmm. So the Italian culture, the Dutch culture, and I have to say, um, I'm going to take the Netherlands as an example. There's an extremely high density Mm -hmm. of extremely capable individuals, mm -hmm. intellectually capable, socially, uh, you know, advanced, like they can interact with many individuals from different cultures mm -hmm. and they can get around. Yeah. Now, is that what you mean with like the one out of five? Like, does that mean that the Western world is that one, out, you know, that, that four out of five and that yeah. there's one part of the world, if we were to generalize, like there's just a, like we are the capable ones in today's society. And there so, is a section that is less capable because of that setting, because we are just advancing at a rate that they cannot possibly chase. Well, absolutely. 
the West is on the driving seat of technology, but only if selected countries in the West and East is also fighting, like South Korea has a pretty high IQ. Can you imagine they make certain chips in a country which is size of an island, which none of the other countries on the planet can replicate. So you can't fight with them either. But what tends to happen is all these people who uh, there is a people gather together and want to have their connections only with the other smart people around them. That's why there is a concentration of intelligence. And uh, then some countries are completely left out or, or completely don't get the opportunity to advance more because people who are in the forefront of making a change has left. And this is a problem with developing nations a lot because their brain is being drained away on a, in a systematic fashion. And you're just yielding from the smartest people on the planet and accumulating them all in one place. So that's creating concentration of intelligence in some countries and deprivation of intelligence. And the, the countries who are getting deprived of intelligence, they're devolving into animalistic behaviors. Mm -hmm. So this is becoming a more of a problem, but with artificial intelligence in the next 10 years, everyone's going to be obsolete and that's the day everyone loses their job everyone becomes lisa doll what do you do then <laughs> is that the moment we're all going to become equal <laughs> yeah the questions of race gender biases and all the social problems that we have today because of human biases inside mm -hmm. our society they're all going to go away because the day we are one species fighting another and inorganic inanimate creation that we made but we have lost control over it that day we unite as species together it's like an alien invasion almost like if aliens were to invade yeah. we would all come together as a species and try to fight this is the most fight. realistic version of alien invasion that you can you can think about i mean what about what about the covid-19 right mm -hmm. let's because it is essentially an alien thing to it's not that alien because it is a virus and viruses we've been in touch with forever and mm -hmm. sars especially there's so many types of sars that we are constantly in touch with yearly on a yearly basis there's yeah. a study that says that two two times out of a year a human is likely to interact with a type of sars now that is, it's not an alien thing, but it kind of drew us all together. Because for a moment in time, everyone was kind of stuck at home. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, across the entire globe, but the vast majority was, I guess, affected by this, right? Mm -hmm. This presence. And I guess, I guess, did that really put us closer to one another? Or did that push the idea of differences between us? Because the Dutch are approaching it very differently to Italy, for example. Absolutely. or Spain or France and we can say that the US has underestimated the the, the threat mm -hmm. so it's like we are all united but we're all very different in the way we approach the problem the problem covers all of us we just approach it differently and I guess with AI it's like as you said South Korea extremely intelligent people standard average IQ of 108 right that's that's obscene but their approach to fixing the problem mm -hmm. of fighting AI mm -hmm. is most likely going to be very different than an approach that per people like me would take, right? Yeah. And so that's the thing. It's like, how do, how do you well. think that unites us? Right, right well, the problem is that specifically with respect, I'm not going to get into COVID-19 because I'm not oh, yeah, going to pretend to be a talk. subject matter expert on biology by Does any means. Mean, but yeah, it has had its own significant psychological effect on people. Certainly. Keeping yourself in isolation. I can completely imagine myself if I had no, not known what meditation is, it would be very difficult for me to isolate myself. But because I had the ability to keep myself calm, I... I came out of that phase and I, I did pretty well during the COVID times. As a matter of fact, I think it was a great experience for me because anyways, I'm just sitting at, in, in, a, in a closed environment surrounded by computers all day long and COVID has not really changed anything for me. But I can completely imagine people who have been pushed into isolation, their brain, which was wired to operate in a society, is now confined to a room and they have to convert that room into a working environment, socializing with their friends on mobile devices, 
talking to their family which they're seeing the entire day but can't talk to them yeah. it, it's getting annoying for them and then they have to think about what they're going to do when this covid-19 thing gets over yeah. so this comes back to biology and psychology and there is an inherent biological clock inside your body you don't your body doesn't need to know what time it is to act to release serotonin to mm-hmm. release uh other hormones in so there is a time uh, there is a biological clock within your body which which keeps ticking yeah on its own i mean yeah and I mean. your brain is aligned to work in sync with the biological clock mm. the moment you push that biological clock out of its own uh of its stable state then you have hormonal problems that devolve into uh, psychological problems essentially that is the biggest problem that we face for three days now. if you don't sleep on the same time slot that you have assigned for yourself the fourth day you're going to feel depression yeah already yeah so with, with this covid-19 thing anyways people are a lot of people are suffering and on top of that at the back where these machines are uh, getting smarter at their jobs more and more people are getting pushed out of job so we think that covid-19 is going to end one day with a vaccine and we can all go back to our jobs mm-hmm. but that's not going to happen because the day you have that vaccine probably it's going to be made by an ai and probably at ai will also be working in your office who has replaced your job so the concept of jobs is obsolete now Mm. for all the people who are watching right now who have or had a job stop thinking about a job job is a human construct which is a byproduct of industrial revolution yep. before the industrial revolution everyone was a farmer and a freelancer so start haggling <laughs> i can appreciate that but um i do have a few questions for example like isolation right mm-hmm. that is one of the things that people fear most because right. it is the absence of human connection mm-hmm. the absence of sharing experiences and understanding others experiences mm-hmm. but it's mostly a psychological uh negative impact right because mm-hmm. you you are only dwelling on your thoughts yeah. remaining in your field and your comfort zone of your brain but mm-hmm. that it no longer is a comfort zone because you're constantly there Absolutely. and you don't even understand who you are anymore but that's the thing is like in a time like this I've talked to a lot of people who are, who thought have thought of getting a psychologist or a psychological analysis of their brain and their emotions and they just say that they don't want to be on a FaceTime call with these doctors for 2 hours who are just blabbering about textbook knowledge like they want human I guess like somewhat less human connection more factual connection mm-hmm. because if you have that falsified human connection with mm-hmm. someone that you can see on a screen but that's not a human mm-hmm. i would i would rather have so, like a literal system tell me what my diagnosis is Absolutely. instead of having a an image of a human mm-hmm. tell me what he thinks it is and i guess that's the part of kaiza that i personally like the most mm-hmm. because you're not only setting out to give people the ability to to be analyzed psychologically mm-hmm. by a third party that cannot store you know like they cannot lose private data and you're talking to him to this to kaiza should i refer to it as a her or her. she i don't know it's it's your creation it's If your friend ai is. takes decides what gender it wants and it chooses a man it will destroy the planet wow i never knew that one please and if ai chooses to be a female then she programs herself to be biologically inclined to produce and have a futuristic approach and conserve the planet i mean i'd have to say like for psychology i would i would assume a female ai would perform better because mm-hmm. females are notorious for having better human skills such as for example we can see this in teaching nursing you know uh, there's a lot of jobs that require a human feeling that males tend to lack yeah Now I'm not throwing shade at anyone who is, you know, a teacher, a male teacher, but it is object an objective truth, yeah, biologically, right? Biologically men and women are different and sex is not malleable. I mean this is a common trend and a subject of discussion and debate in society a lot. Yeah, a lot. That I don't feel like a man or don't feel like a woman. Mm-hmm. There are there is a certain portion of the society who feels subjected to uh the social pressures of acting biologically in their way. but the more you 
wire your brain away from that thought it becomes your reality and till the time you are okay with your brain and your individual identity in that zone it's fine but the moment you step out and s- demand society to accept it that's when you are putting your happiness in someone else's hand and when society doesn't accept it then you basically commit suicide like yeah there is 40% chance of a transgender going through a surgery and committing suicide at the end of it yeah i so, can see i can see why so that is these are very complex topics and different avenues of human intelligence and by no stretch of the imagination am i capable of solving all of these problems because these if else conditions just go exponentially increasing for the solution that i'm trying to create that's why you delegate the task of understanding the human beings internal wiring to an ai the moment it understands the wiring that's in your brain it becomes your alter ego and it knows your weaknesses it knows your strength now comes the question of control yeah now if there is an alter ego that's as good as you are mm-hmm. and it knows your strengths and weaknesses you it can make you do anything yes right? manipulating so who gets to you. control this you should be able to control your alter ego that's accepted and agreed but all the computational power on the planet is basically controlled by corporations and they own everything that you do your yep. personal and pri- private life basically is a function of data stored in some data center yep. and it's not your property you've already lost control with it with gdpr we are trying to get that control back but battle is already lost and a lot of left i mean i'd have to say like you know the idea of free psychological help through someone that's not biased in any way through mm-hmm. someone that cannot be biased because if you th- like it is biased in some ways in the sense of statistical analysis so mm-hmm. basing on objective truth it will tell you a specific thing or a statistical truth rather but i guess that is still superior to having a human tell you their opinion or their understanding of a situation when their understanding of a situation is simply situational right is is a moment in time situation everywhere you know? but it, it's it's rather like you know if i for example i'm born in the 90s mm-hmm. i have a different perspective of uh transgenders than someone born in the 30s Absolutely. but that's what i'm saying psychologists tend to be of an age of around 50, 40 to 60 years old mm-hmm. and that's the thing is like the problems of now are very different than the problems and the approaches that we used before exactly. so how can we expect a human to adapt quickly enough to really comprehend the problem and find a solution the only possible way that a, i guess i can call it a being that, that that a being can understand analyze and and create an outcome or an output is if it's an ai yeah absolutely and it will not be biased It it's just is it a matter of best time, of your interest it? it's a matter of time how long do you think people will take to adapt to the idea that their data can be used for good well it's a, not a matter of time it's a matter of acceptance you've already lost the battle of your identity yep that's already <laughs> yeah it's already in the hands of the corporations the only acceptance that you have to bring into the society is that soon enough there will be a uh, there will be automated systems with us among us which will be vastly more smart than other human beings and how do you how do you accept them yeah. in your lives so we are trying to over, oversee the entire process we create regulatory bodies so that ai doesn't spin out of control yeah but uh, it's not enough it's not even talk merely enough and the reason for that is again i told you is because of the competence hierarchy if the guy who was operating the ai is sitting at 120 the guy who needs to make a regulation has to have an iq of 140 to preemptively <laughs> identify what this guy can do so it's a function of if competence and there are very few people who reach the, who are operating at that level and because of the the system of economics that we have and we have you know entangled ourselves in everything is basically about money and power for human beings they will they are not interested in human good or sustenance or uh, uh how how badly we are spoiling the environment yeah. they are only concerned with their margins and that margin is a number for them yeah, i guess uh, we really do live in a society 
But we have unfortunately run out of time, All right. which does sadden me quite a lot. This was a very interesting conversation. For I want to thank well. you for joining us and letting us know about your wisdom and your experiences. Uh, I want to thank everyone involved. Thank you. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. All right. Nice. Ooh.